Good afternoon, and welcome to It's Your Smarter Money with Dr. Laura, Professor Steve. And we want to talk a little bit about the large large cap arena because that continues to be one of the largest asset classes that most people are investing in. Um, as we look at the large cap um, uh, area, we continue to see the same thing that we've seen over the course of at least the past year or so, where um, the top 10 stocks are really driving a lot of the growth. And so this chart just talks about the fact that um, the top 10 stocks are highly concentrated. If you look at from 1998 through 2024, you can see that right before the dot-com bubble, um, there were 10 top stocks really driving the concentration of the S&P 500. Then um, the, the crash and um, the the breadth of all the different stocks was much more even. All the stocks were working much more in tandem. But over the most recent years, really since the pandemic, we've seen a separation where there have been people, some people call it the top seven stocks. They'll say the Magnificent Seven. Some people will say the top 10. But it's this, this group of just having a handful of stocks make um make up the bulk I, at this point right now it's um somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 30 percent um of the stocks are I, i'm sorry 10 of the stocks are making up over 30 percent of the overall s p 500 this gives yeah. us pause and so when we take a step back and we say well how should we be investing in the large cap arena we want to look at strategies to help us find those stocks that maybe aren't so overvalued. And I want to just want to mention there was a study published in the Wall Street Journal recently by some university professors that showed that when you when there's been different cycles of these favorite stocks, the media likes to latch on because they they seem to outperform the market uh, as a whole for you know for a year or two, sometimes longer. But after that happens, typically those starts tar those stocks start to start to languish. So you invested in in those stocks, probably a year or two after that, you would have found you wouldn't perform as well as the market in many many cases. So right. of course the problem being is how do you choose which are going to be the next, uh, you know, Fab Seven or whatever they call them anymore. Well, for a while, but it was the Fang stocks. Remember them? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the big one was in two thousand, of course, with when they were so uh, overblown. So because of that, we want to look for strategies where we're looking at real intrinsic value of the overall companies that are the underlying um, companies of these stocks. And so um, we always tend to like to use in the large cap arena um, a tax efficient type of investment. And we look at ETFs that tend to have also lower expense ratios, but there are some ETFs that have D different types of strategies. And so we particularly latched on to this one um, strategy, which is focusing on cash flow. And it just so happens that one of the companies that really was the first out of the gate to offer this strategy was a company called Pacer. We're not yep. tied to Pacer. Um, there are some other companies that are starting to introduce this strategy, but Pacer has had some really tremendous performance, haven't they, Steve? Uh, they have, and you know they've been really an ex excellent performer this year. And also, their their CAF, uh, their small cap version of it, performed extremely well last year. Uh, you know, I think we're going to show in one of the next slides some of the performance uh, of late, and actually over the last three to five years, I believe as well. Uh, you know, it, we're going to go over the strategy in much more detail uh, in, as this video progresses. But there is a lot of research behind the strategy, by the way, so which we'll cover. <clears throat> right. Well. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. And so it just shows you some of the performance. This was actually as of last week. Uh, we pulled these numbers. And you can see that, for example, the uh, Pacer U.S. cash cows, that's the large cap one, uh, is annualized uh, five-year return has been 17% a year. And if you look at the S&P, it's been about 14.5% a year. That's a significant difference. You know, if you compound a couple percent a year over the three, four, five years, in terms of the dollar amount you would have in terms of wealth, it's significantly higher. And also, their small cap is is wildly outperformed the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, small cap value index, as you see, fifteen percent uh, per year for over the last five years versus nine and a half. I mean, that that's significant. And so, yeah. Yeah. absolutely. And look again, 
you know that that favorite phrase, you know, past performance is no prediction of future results. And we'll always say that, but it this is a, a an excellent approach we believe in a long term. But again, you know, things can change. But the strategy makes a lot of sense, Steve. And you know, the the thing is, is that um back in 90, 1992, Fama and French published a very well a seminal article around the fact that value is the place to focus. And by the way, how do you measure value? Well, they measured back in 1992, historically, that value was all about book to price. Um, and years yep. ago, that was really the appropriate metric. But this study was done in 1992. And this is the thing that Steve and I harp on all the time is not just to focus on the science, but focus on updated and relevant science because things change. When we talk about the fact that 60-40 used to be a great portfolio back in the 80s, um, but now it's not so much. It's the same type of thing. Book to value or, or book to price used to be the best way to, to measure value. And yeah. most of the indexes are still using that metric, right? That's correct. And I just want to mention that, you know, book value is a is a an accounting construct. It shows you what what they how they value a company on its books. And and we're going to go over to this in a minute, how they actually value companies in terms of their assets. But you know, I I don't want to sound like I was prescient, but I argued with a couple of companies about how they measure value eight or nine years ago. And I just didn't think that book value is a good measure of a company's uh, it's actual... about ta tangible assets, right? That's right. And that's why, but but when it comes to intangibles, it's not so much. Now, right. um, the Russell 1000 happens to be, um, I I think the ticker is IWB that represents one yes. Russell 1000. That yep. happens to be one of the top value um, ETFs that are out there that people use a lot of times when they want to talk about value. We would argue. You know what? If they're focused on just book to value, they're missing the mark. And um, what we right. see with these other indexes as well, the S and P five hundred. Okay, so they at least use um, earnings for sales or uh, earnings to price and sales to price. So they have some other um, flavor there, but still, book to price is part of their selection process, which yep. we think is a, a missed opportunity. Yeah, it definitely is. We I think as well. And so this shows you, uh, for example, some of the. Uh, Top 10 S&P holdings, uh, 1980 versus now here. Uh, and, and what's happened is if you look at the types of companies that were in the top 10 holdings in, in 1980, they had more physical assets. So they may have had real estate, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, other types of physical assets, machinery, that type of thing. Whereas some of the companies that, that are now in the top 10 holdings, they have what are called intangible assets, which we're going to cover in more detail what those are in a couple of the slides. And it's interesting, but, it flipped. It flipped it, yeah. in the 90s. It actually flipped where it was yeah. more of the companies were more had tangible assets. Then it flipped. And that's what Fam and French missed because they were looking in the back rear view mirror and um, didn't really project forward because it started becoming more and more. 1995, I think it was something like 60% of um, the assets were actually intangible. And it just... Yes. Mushroom to now the point where most large portion of the assets are intangible. That's correct. Yep. And nobody could have predicted that. But again, that's the problem with using some of these measures, because as I said, book value is it, it's a, an accounting construct. And it may not always, accounting constructs may not may not always accurately reflect the real world. And so that that is was it's I think the issue is not necessarily so much with their research is rather the measure they use to determine what value is. So. And so I think this goes back to what you were saying. So tangible assets include buildings, machinery, vehicles, that type of thing. Intangible assets, a lot of which were not counted as book value, include things like patents, uh, technology, uh, goodwill, which is also, by the way, an accounting construct. Goodwill arises when a firm buys another firm. So when you buy another firm, that they could be buying, in effect, future income because of the goodwill that company has, perhaps intellectual property. Um, other things that they're buying at that time. And those things brand, don't really go. Oh, I'm sorry. Brand name is another one. That's right. Yeah, that's a great point. Yep. Yep. And so the way they were measuring book value was based, as we said, only on those tangible assets. They weren't considering the intangible assets. And there's been re some research done on this. In fact, there was an article, uh, you know, which Laura and I both have read at, from the CFA Institute about six or seven years ago, uh, covering this very issue about it, the 
the, um, the value of intangible assets, and really they should be somehow reflected when you measure value. Okay. And so what's important is not just the intangible assets, but something called free cash flow. And so what Pacer looks at, and you know, and possibly some other ETFs that are coming out, they look at free cash flow in relation to uh, the intangible assets. All right. And so free cash flow means cash flow after a company takes their, their gross earnings and deducts from it expenses, uh, interest, taxes, and uh, long-term investments. In other words, uh, perhaps investments in uh, physical plants and patents and other things of that nature and research possibly. Um, and that number that's left after, after all of that is actually free cash flow. Okay. And so yeah. what can you use free? Oh, good, Laura. Go no, ahead. No, I was just going to add. So, so intangibles versus uh, tangibles has really nothing to do with this. That was just one way of measuring. So yeah. now we're, uh, we're saying, well, what is really the best way of measuring the value of a company? And, yeah. you know, just going back to business school, it was always about cash. Why do you care about cash? Well, if you have cash, you can invest in R&D. You can invest in a new plant. You can invest in more people. You can pay out dividends. You can do a lot of things when you have cash. Cash is power for a company to have cash. So really cash is after everything else is done, after we got, we received our revenue, we paid all expenses, and we even invested in things in the business. How much money do we have to put in our pocket to make a decision on how we want to better our business? And so it gives the business a lot of freedom. It's, it's really all about how a business can operate. So it's even better than, um, like earnings, fine, you know, that's what, or dividends, like a lot of times people like to follow dividends and, you know, we do use sometimes some dividend exposure, but just because a company's paying dividends doesn't mean that they still have the same freedom of having enough cash. They might be committed yeah. to paying that dividend because that's what they said they were going to do and they don't want to renege on that, but they're having to scramble to get the money to do that. That's a really good point. So the, the, the way to liken that is a, a, a farmer eating a seed coin, a corn. And so what they're doing is, in effect, they're, they're paying out to the shareholders cash that may have been, some of it at least, would have been better used to uh, grow the business and invest in perhaps new technology because maybe their technology is getting old, perhaps uh, a more efficient uh, plant, that type of thing. So and we're going to show a slide. to pay it. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. That too. We have a perfect example of that in a couple of slides, by the way, of a company that actually did that. Was they were Chinese? paying us too much. Yeah. Oh, okay. Much- you have that on there? All right. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. so that, that ratio of free cash flow to enterprise value, which includes both tangible and intangible assets, that's the important measure that we're looking at and that Pacer is deciding or using to choose uh, the, the, comp- the stocks in which they want to invest within the ETF. And so studies show that companies that have the greatest free cash flow also perform the best. Okay. And you can see that if you look at the uh the top, the first decile in terms of performance of companies are those with the highest free cash flow. And so there's academic research that backs this approach. Now we're always careful to add a caveat, even even with um with research, you know, based on past history. And Farmer French is a perfect example of that. Things can change. But right now, it looks like that's been one of the best indicators performance for stock or companies that have the highest free cash flow. But, you know, Steve, I, I you know, I just feel really, really adamant about this, that um, yeah. unless somebody doesn't measure the cash flow correctly, yeah, no possible way that it couldn't be the winner. Because if you yes. have more cash, you just have more ability to do more with your business. You just do. Yep. So I almost like it to a law of physics, you know, right? Yep. yep. Yeah, this is like gravity. (laughs) That's right. Yeah, really. Yep. Yep. And that's from a past physics major. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. And also, uh, you know, we have here in this slide, it shows you, uh, let's see here, percent of the negative, actually negative months uh, for using different approaches. And Price to Book has had a pretty fair number of uh, negative performance months uh, versus the, uh, the free cash flow to enterprise value approach. And there's some other approaches here too, as well. But it, it clearly from this different work, valuation metrics, right? That different yep. different funds use. Yep. And what they did was they put it on this XY um, uh, 
platform or this arena where on the Y axis, you have return and on the yep. X. So the higher, the better, of course. And then on the X axis, they have risk. And so yep. the left further to the left um, is less risk. And they have this from 1991 to 2023. Oh, and a 12 month rolling process where they looked at all these metrics and said, you know, if you focus on price to book, well, that's the most risky and yeah. not so great. I'm surprised that dividend yield isn't better, but it isn't, which is- There's reasons I think for that we'll show in a minute. Okay. Um, yeah. Even the PE ratio isn't as, because the PE ratio is only part of the um, equation, right? You know, it could have multiple yeah. issues. It could have, yeah. So- Well, price is- is also a, a metric that's related to uh, behavior has behavioral characteristics embedded in it. The price of a stock is really sort of determined by traders and also what they view as the future of a company. Right. And we know a lot of times are wrong and they've overvalued right. companies. That's why PE ratio is not always a great measure. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, so how does this, how do they actually choose these companies? Well, they start out with the Russell 1000 index. Um, and they they actually filter it down to those companies, the top hundred companies in terms of free cash flow, and what and they invest in those top one hundred companies, but they invest in them equally, which is also an important point. And so, in other words, they're not saying, well, let's let's capitalization weight it and in actually embed into the index that the effect that I think comes to some extent comes from a behavioral aspect, which means that the capitalization of a company which is, is the value of the company in terms of its stock price times the number of outstanding shares, that stock price has a, that behavioral characteristic embedded in it. A lot of times companies are overvalued by traders. So to, to exclude that factor, they, e they equally weight these top 100 companies uh, that for free cash flow in relation to enterprise value. And to maintain the top 100, they rebalance quarterly. Every three months, they re rerun the screen to come up with the the uh, companies that have the top 100 in terms of free cash flow and, and enterprise value. That's important. And it's especially important to just be an ETF because if you do that in a mutual fund and you could not use this strategy with a mutual yeah. fund, exactly. It'd be a mess. <laughs> yeah, it'd, be a mess. Yeah, it'd be a tax nightmare. Um, yes, and, and so I, I do want to point out um, just on the left-hand side here where we're comparing the Russell 1000 mm -hmm. to um, the first screening of the 100 companies. And look at the the PE ratio is a function of it. It, That's it a good point. literally halved. So it definitely does. Um, you know, it is an element of finding those gems of companies that are really producing. And um, yep. yeah, it's interesting that when you actually start weighting it towards, you know, everybody's um two percent. So everybody has an even representation within the fund. And the fact yep. that they're rebalancing it every quarter. And you have some great slides, Steve, that you created that show by rebalancing it, what happens to the dynamic of um, the uh, different com composition of the fund too. So that's, that's, that's right. Yep. Okay. Oh, there it is. okay. Yeah. And so this shows you the Russell uh, 1000 uh, by sector. And if you look at this, I, I may be hard to read, uh, you know, a significant portion of it's technology and technology other than some of the I mean, perhaps companies like NVIDIA don't always have the best. It's uh, the green. It's the, like, yeah, the in green. Value. Thank you. Uh, the best um, ratio of free cash value to enterprise value. Um, so they're not always exactly the best place to be. And they don't always represent what we consider to be true value for that reason. But but um, also, Steve, in addition to that, um, what what will be apparent when you see the next slide that he's created. Um, so this is the Russell 1000, which again is filtering on book to value. It's yeah. not really capturing the dynamic changes in the economy. So That's it's almost, it's very, very steady. And yeah. um, it's, there's no real uh, harbinger that's saying, well, the economy is actually changing and we need to make switches. And um, that's yeah. why I love these two slides. If, and you want to switch to the second slide? Yeah, and I just want to mention that I couldn't. We couldn't get the direct data from the uh, from the actual index, so we used a uh, an ETF here that exactly mirrors the index. I think the symbol is. Uh, I think is. I think you mentioned earlier. It might be ICB. I, IWV. IWV. Thank you. Yep. And so this is Pacer, and look at the difference. 
And it's yeah. amazing because it, so now look at Steve. This is so cool. Cause I was looking at it earlier. Um, the, um, turquoise color, our favorite color, the turquoise, which yeah. is energy that yes, really exactly. just kind of blossomed in 2022. It basically yep. said, okay, these, uh, the oil companies have all been able to raise their prices and have really just generated additional cash flow. And so the fund, because it's rebalancing every quarter, was able to take yep. advantage of that. It's it's literally taking advantage of the economic cycle as we go on, which I just think is so cool. It, it, yeah, that, that's exactly. And it's taking I should work for this company. I'm a fan. Yeah, I am too. <laughs> Well, it's taking advantage of the way certain sectors of the of the economy, you know, flower and others sort of wane and don't do as well. And it's sort of taking advantage of that as it occurs, which is really amazing. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah. And like you said, the rotation into different sectors through time. But uh, I'm going to add the caveats to this. This is not these are not decisions made by active managers who so frequently could be wrong. And 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 it's so difficult to prove that if they are right, that their their uh, choices were made. Because of skill rather than luck, it's very hard. So, so for example, Steve, um, the the lime lime green again that technology that's on the bottom, yeah, um, has actually decreased. And uh, and you know, looking at the actual holdings that are in cash cow, I don't think they have any of those magnificent seven right now in their holdings. Any no. of the Nvidia's or any of them, they're all out because they're not creating well. Five years from now, they might. Yep. Right now, they're not creating the cash flow to warrant being on this um, chart. And since we're definitely big believers in intrinsic value, not what we think could possibly happen someday in the future, maybe, possibly, could have, maybe. <laughs> we, we don't tend to focus on that. We want to invest in things that are real. It makes a lot of sense. Well, I just want to mention quickly, I was, I was interviewed by a reporter about three weeks ago regarding Bitcoin and what my feelings were about Bitcoin. So in our view, if you were investing in something, for something to be a real investment, it needs to throw off income somehow, somewhere, sometime, right? Bonds throw off a coupon. Stocks uh, throw off dividends. They throw off some income to the shareholder. Bitcoin throws off no income to you. So in other words, it's only real value is what somebody else is willing to pay for it. Okay. Whereas if something that throws off income is always going to have value, no matter what. Okay. And so you need something that actually throws off income, in my opinion, to call it a real investment. By the way, that was, you know, which was pretty funny in the Wall Street Journal. They had an article mentioned one of the partners of Goldman Sachs said the exact same thing about Bitcoin, for example. So we yeah, don't like things like I don't think I had one professor in, when I went to get an MBA that didn't say that every class, cash is king. That's right. Exactly right. And theoretically, by the way, if you go into, if you want to be a real geek, they, they've always said that the price of a stock or the value of a stock is a div, uh, the discounted value of all future dividends effectively. So, okay, we, this is sort of just another slide that says the same thing. We'll just go past that one. Okay. So I think maybe, Lord, this is a great one to use as an example of a company yeah, that was absolutely General Electric. And they were paying out more through in dividends than they should have been. And so people didn't realize that they were actually getting paid more than just what the company was earning. In effect, they were getting the company was sort of hollowing itself out to, to maintain that dividend scale. And uh, it actually was an article about General Electric in the, in the journal just about, I think it was last week. That company, is, they shed most of their uh, divisions now. And I think they're down to jet engines and some things like that. They, they Their consumer division's gone. A lot of their income was for a while coming from the that financial services uh, uh, uh division they had as well that's gone as well and so general electric has shrank dramatically as a company there so that shows you, you can't just rely on the dividend scale of a company you know you need to look at free cash flow it's more important than uh, how much the company's paying in dividends mm. yeah they haven't um never recouped from 2000 no they haven't yep it's 24 years later they're still down and i remember in the early part of the uh, well, two decades ago, people said General Electric was a can't miss stock. You know, yeah. you know, yep. So, yeah, we've heard that before, right? Yep. And so this shows you um, the the uh, price. Uh, this is the uh, the CAF uh, Pacer ETF. This is the small cap one. It shows you the ratio of free cash flow um, 
to uh, stock price for the uh, Pacer ETF versus the U.S. fund small value. And you can look at it, it's 5.61, which is really low. So you're not paying a lot for uh, that free cash flow versus U.S. fund small value. You're paying roughly 13 times each dollar, $13 for each dollar of free cash flow. And in Pacer, you're paying $5.61. That's a big difference. Um, you know, and the difference is even greater for a lar the large cap version. You know, the S and P right now you're paying thirty one dollars for each dollar of free cash flow, which is astounding. Uh, and for Pacer, you're paying nine dollars and fifty six cents for each dollar of free cash flow. A lot of that it's because of those ten stocks That's that are right. not on Pacer. <laughs> well, they represent. You said it about almost thirty five percent of the index right yeah. now. Those ten stocks, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay. <clears throat> and this shows you the uh, hypothetical growth of the, um, this is hypothetical, going back to 2016, of uh, the Cow-Z index versus the S&P 500 uh, dividend aristocrats, which is another index where they, I think, I, I don't forget completely how it's structured, but I do know, I, th I believe they take that the companies that have the highest dividend ratios in yeah. terms of uh, Divid yeah. dividend yield. I dividend believe. yield, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And also uh, the S and P high dividend index as well, and you can see Pacer, you know, uh, really um, wildly outperforms both. I mean, it's pretty stunning, you know. And that's uh, since 2016. Yeah, it's so. interesting how so so the fund really hasn't been. In, it started in 2016, right? Yeah, I believe um, so. But it's interesting how it kind of they were kind of a little bit tighter back in, um, you know, the later part of that yeah. decade and then came 2020 and it just really separated like that it's amazing yeah and that's why we're always cautious because we don't know what's right. going to happen in the future right 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 and i just want to mention this is just one of three or four strategies we have in, in in the large cap area as well because we we hate to always depend just on one particular strategy because we know that it can also fall out of favor even temporarily uh you know so we want to try to balance things out in our different asset classes and try to adopt different strategies, but all based on research that we've read. So. Right. I, yes. And and so I certainly, I mean, I'm, you know, kind of waxing poetic about um all this this strategy. And I really yeah. believe in this strategy. And I, I think that it and you Steve too. does as well. And um we think that it makes a lot of sense. It is possible, especially in short the short run, there are a lot of times where the market doesn't make sense. There's emotional things that are happening. There are other things yeah. that are going on. Um, but but we do think that it makes a lot of sense. And um, so we do uh, try to use these strategies in all of our portfolios, regardless of whether you're risk adverse or, or aggressive. And um, we, we feel that it's been it's been working so far, but we are paying attention and you know, right. Do you try to keep in mind that um, things change. Things always change. Every time you yeah. think that it's the right answer, um, it's time to relook at it. So we can and we keep that. our eyes on it. That's for sure. And we are we also keep up on our research. Uh, you know, reading academic studies and you know because things do change. Mm -hmm. so. so thank you so much for listening to us again. I hope that you learned something from this or that you found some value in it. Um, as we've always said in the past, we continue to try to listen to you. If you have questions that, that you would like us to talk just individually to you, or you think it's something that might be valuable to other people, please let us know. Um, we're looking forward to talking soon. Bye.